on the verge of retirement, an old custodian, school custodian, is training in his replacement. One day they're walking down the hall and they turn into the cafeteria and both their eyes widen in shock as they realize that the entire cafeteria floor is covered in water. Immediately, the trainee grabs a mop and bucket and frantically starts mopping things up. He's so involved in the mopping that he senses something's wrong. He looks up and he sees the old custodian walking away. And he's thinking, oh, you know, he must know where some better mops are. We're going to need all the help we can get if we're going to get this thing cleaned up by lunchtime. So he keeps going away. It doesn't seem to be making any progress. And then he looks up and he sees the old custodian coming back, and he's empty-handed. At this point, the trainee loses it. His face turns red. A vein pops out in his forehead. He goes, what are you doing? I'm over here doing all the work, and you're acting like you're on break time. The old custodian slowly grabs the remaining mop and with a half grin looks at him and says, son, you have to turn off the leaking faucet before you mop up the mess. <laughs> you know, now more than ever, we are frantically mopping up our pain. And truth is, there is no shortage of mops. There are potions, lotions, pills, techniques, procedures, imaging, lasers, stem cells. But the question we have to ask is, are we getting to the leaking faucet? Are we getting to the cause? <coughs> Listen, if we were meant to age gracefully, and by that I mean age healthily and with as little pain as possible, the answer is in how well we move. And I sh hope, to share, hope today to share insights on that with you. Now, to be clear, what I'm talking about today is musculoskeletal pain, which is pain that's originating from the muscles, the joints, the cartilage, the nerves. And what I'm not talking about is the kind of pain that you get when you stub your toe. That kind of pain is good. You actually want that pain because that pain protects you. It tells you that you need to be more careful. The kind of pain we're talking about today is the kind of pain you don't want. The ongoing pain. It's there week after week, month after month, year after year. It's the kind of pain that stops you from being you. Now, if this is you, just know that you're not the only one. You know, I was surprised when I read that more people suffer from chronic pain than heart disease, cancer, and diabetes combined. Now, pain, it robs sleep, it steals energy, it drains finances, but eventually, like most people, eventually we get sick and tired of being sick and tired, so we do something about it. We rest it, we ice it, we heat it, and when that doesn't work, we follow the doctor's orders, we take the medication, we do the therapy, we have the injection, we undergo the surgery, and more times than what we are led to believe, we end up still in pain. Well, that's the first myth that I want to share with you, is that there is a cure-all to pain. There isn't. You see, chronic pain is best viewed as a disease, just like diabetes. It's not something that gets fixed. It's not like an infection where you take an antibiotic and then it's gone. It's something that we have to work on getting it as good as possible, and then we got to put energy into it to keep it well. Because just like any other condition, like heart disease or diabetes, if it's not managed, it just gets worse. And it's true also with your musculoskeletal system. If it's not properly maintained, it just gets worse. Now, instead of heeding early warning signs, also chronic pain is a disease, instead of heeding early warning signs, a lot of people choose to ignore it. And I think it's almost like an automatic thing. I'm just going to put this off for right now. The ignore it myth. See, pain is a sign that there is a problem. So if we ignore it, it just gets worse. I think that makes sense. But what surprised me was when I, when I was in school and I learned what a, something in the nervous system that develops, and it's called sensitization. Has anyone heard of sensitization? Okay, it's, it's, it actually serves a protective function, but it's not the happiest thing. So get this, the longer your body's in pain, the more nerves your body creates in that area that have, that have the ability to feel pain. And not only that, those nerves, so you have more nerves, and then those nerves also increase in sensitivity. So over time, the longer the pain is there, it actually takes less and less for it to feel more and more pain, which makes it harder and harder for you to do the things that you want to do. Now the next thing is what I call the workaround myth. So if you can't ignore it, we're just going to figure out how to work around it. The workaround myth is pretty tricky, and, and I'll tell you about this. So 
let's say every time you vacuum, your low back gets thrown into thunderous muscle spasms. So what do you say? We identify this thing. Doing that thing causes pain, so we avoid doing it. I'm not going to vacuum as much, or I'm going to do it differently because I don't want to aggravate my back and make it worse. Now, the problem with that is that your joints, your muscles, your cartilage, they require stress to stay strong. So if they're deprived of that stress, you actually end up with a weaker back, and now other activities that shouldn't cause pain start to cause issues, like maybe it's washing dishes now. So now you start avoiding that, which causes more weakness. And then the next thing starts to fall. And then it acts as a domino effect. And pretty soon, you're just not able to do normal activities in life. Pain is best addressed head on. Don't try to ignore it. Don't work around it. Before I share with you this, the next myth, I want to tell you a little story about myself. I, one of the most common questions I get asked is, how did I even like get into being a chiropractor, and it's actually because of these two. This is my grandma Dorothy and grandpa Norris. Uh, they grew up on a farm in northern Minnesota, and they raved, raised five kids on a farm in northern Minnesota. After grandpa passed away, grandma came to live with my family. So my hometown is Stewartville, Minnesota. It's kind of by Rochester. So grandma would stay with us, and she would get all of her medical checkups at Mayo. And I'm the youngest of three. And so my brother and sister were off at college, so I would come home, and I, and I like to tell myself I was grandma's favorite, because <laughs> I would come home, and there before me would be a batch of freshly baked sugar cookies. You know, she was Norwegian, she had short white hair, a laugh that was just contagious, and she was the kind of gal that would keep you on your feet. I remember in the bathroom, she had a little poster that said, uh, now that grandpa's gone, grandma, do you ever get lonely? And she said, no. We asked, really, why? And she said, well, I'm visited by two men every night. Ben Gay and arthritis. <laughs> Those are good years. So I'm in college. I'm in pre-med. I was actually headed toward cardiovascular medicine. And sometimes how it happens in life, I'm learning, is that it just changes. And it changes in such a sudden direction that you're never the same. So grandma's in the hospital. She's getting some testing done. Mom was with her. Mom's down the hallway. And suddenly she hears this blood-curdling scream knows right away it's mom she runs down the hallways turns the corner into the room and she sees that it's taking two male nurses their full force and strength to try to hold down my tiny 87 year old grandma she's writhing in pain emergency procedures take place they rush her out and we're left wondering what's going on emergency surgery takes place her life is saved thank god after that we sit down with the doctor and he tells us that Dorothy has suffered a perforated ulcer. Has anyone heard of a perforated ulcer? Where he tells us that it's one of the most painful things a human can experience. Hers was so bad, he explained it that it's as if the ulcer burnt a hole through her stomach lining, and now the acid in her stomach was burning her, her internal organs. Now, at that point, I was far enough in my education as far as the human body that a question popped up in my mind, and maybe it popped up in your mind, what causes a perforated ulcer? So I ask him that. And his answer is what changes my life. He says, and almost, you know, kind of that cold surgical way, it was probably due to the medications he's been taking for her back pain and arthritis for years. And at that moment, I feel like I'm hit by a lightning bolt, and it just dawns on me that these things that were supposed to be helping her were actually hurting her. And so right then and there, I decide that I'm dedicating my life as far as like health care to helping people be pain-free and healthy, but here's my one rule, I'm not gonna prescribe any medication. That's my thing. A little while later, I cross paths with a doctor who seems to be helping a lot of people. I go in and shadow her, and all she's doing is going room to room. It looks like she's just cracking backs, taking x-rays. But what I'm most impressed with at her clinic, and she's a chiropractor, and what I'm most impressed with at her clinic is that, it, to my eyes, it looks like people are just having miracles with their health. And I said, okay, that's what I'm gonna do. Now, that was 15 years ago now. And so this next myth is personal for me, and it's, the, it's okay to take something for the pain. It's harmless. Now, I think we all know that like Tylenol, ibuprofen, acetaminophen, Excedrin, Aleve, Aspirin, they all have side effects. And they're particularly tough on our stomachs, our livers, and our kidneys. But one thing I think just gets missed, especially with the constant advertisements we get on medication, is just how devastating these side effects really are. So let's take acetaminophen, found in Tylenol, okay? 
Now, you, if you can see this, you'll see that there are numbers by these. These are research studies, so don't take my word for it. Acetaminophen, it's the deadliest over-the-counter pain reliever on the market, and it's the nation's leading cause of acute liver failure. Federal data shows that every year this drug is responsible for sending as many as 78,000 Americans to the emergency room due to overdose, mostly because liver damage can occur from taking a smaller amount than you might think. According to the FDA, taken over just several days, as little as 25% above the maximum daily dose, or which is just two additional extra strength pills per day, cause liver damage. Take ibuprofen, naproxen, aspirin. According to the New England Journal of Medicine, every year these drugs, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, now that's important. I'm going to be referencing a study a little later. Remember that the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories cause at least 16,500 Americans to bleed to death, mostly through their stomachs and guts, making it the 15th most common cause of death in the United States. So it is bad. And, you know, and, the, and these are the, the medications we can pick up at the grocery store. I mean, you can't even watch the news without seeing the latest controversy on how big pharma's jacking up medications or the opioid crisis that we're in. That myth is bad, and it's a shocker, and it's uncomfortable. But this one really, this one tips me over the edge, because this is, I think, one of the most common things we hear is that, hey, we should take this because it helps with the inflammation. The truth is that they interfere with inflammation and that's a really important difference, and this is why, is that let's say you're raking the lawn and your back flares up. You go in, you take ibuprofen, help with the inflammation. Really what happens is that you chemically interfere with the inflammation, so in the short term you feel better. But that same chemical process interferes with the natural healing process your body is supposed to go through from a flare-up like that. Short term you feel better. Long term, you end up with a weaker back. Next time you try to do something, maybe it's rake or maybe it's something else, it flares up again. Then it's another medication cycle, and then it, it keeps creating more and more weakness. And this is, this is well known. It started in like professional sports. They started to look into this. And so this is from the Journal of Open Rehabilitation. It's like physical therapists, chiropractors look into this. This is 2013. This is an interesting study because it reviewed 203 other studies. So this was a study that was studying studies. Okay? It's, it's kind of, well, anyway, so, and this is what they concluded is that NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, should simply not be used for acute or chronic soft tissue injuries. Acute soft tissue injury is the flare-up from raking. Chronic is the ongoing pain just because it interferes with how the body is supposed to heal itself. Now, you might be feeling a little tension right now, like, <laughs> what am I supposed to do? Very soon, I'm going to share with you a health secret. There are actually two things you can be taking every day that have shown to have the same benefit as far as pain relief as these medications, and there's zero side effects. I'm, I'll, show, I'll show you that in a second. Oh, here it is. Okay. <laughs> it's omega-3 and vitamin D. So omega-3 is found in fish oils, vitamin D. Okay, the, our bodies are supposed to create vitamin D in response to sunlight. Okay, vitamin D is a big deal in the body. It's actually a hormone. If your body doesn't have vitamin D, you do, every single cell in your body has a vitamin D receptor, which means every single cell in your body has to have vitamin D, otherwise it doesn't function properly. This is interesting, at least to me, because this is a journal, Surgical Neurology. So this is a journal actually for spinal surgeons. Our results mirror other controlled studies so what they're saying is that their results are reflecting what other people have found that compare ibuprofen to omega-3s. And what they demonstrate is equivalent effect in reducing arthritic pain. So omega-3s have the equivalent effect of reducing pain from arthritis. Fish oil supplements appear to be a safer alternative to NSAIDs for the treatment of non-surgical neck or back pain in this selective group. The importance of this work to neurosurgeons is that now there is a pain reliever, an analgesic agent, that can take the place of COX-2 inhibitors, that's NSAIDs, and be used with no side effects. Now, but there is a fundamental difference between an ibuprofen and an omega-3. See, an ibuprofen, once again, it interferes with inflammation and the response is immediate. Omega-3 does not work that way. If you have a back flare-up and you take an omega-3, it's not gonna give you relief. The reason why is that as your body 
the cells in your body die and are replaced, the omega-3 has to be present in your bloodstream so that the cells that are made are made with this omega-3 in the body. So this is uh, for uh, supplementation for inflammatory joint pain. Previous reports suggest that the therapeutic effects of omega-3 are usually manifest after approximately three months. So you have to be taking it consistently on a daily basis for three months in order to get the same type of pain relief as you would from ibuprofen right away. So no, it's not as convenient, but this actually makes you healthier. Vitamin D, look at this. Many patients with vitamin D deficiency may complain of full, persistent, generalized muscle aches and pains. Who doesn't have generalized muscle aches and pains? Okay, and weakness, and fatigue, and fibromyalgia, and chronic fatigue syndrome, vitamin D. Because its actions are under, address underlying processes, vitamin D supplementation may take months to facilitate pain relief. It's, it's the same type of thing. When I was putting this together, I had a thought, you know, snowbirds, right? We take off, we go down to warmer climates. And one of the most common things I hear in the clinic is, I feel better down there. And certainly the warmth has something to do with it. But also think, our body creates a tremendous amount of vitamin D in response to sunlight naturally. I don't think it's a coincidence that people who travel south say they also feel better. I think vitamin D is playing a role with that. The next myth, it's the, there's a procedure for that myth. Now beyond medications, there's injections, nerve blocks, nerve ablation, spinal cord stimulators, stem cells, opioid surgery, special inflatable back braces, special juices from the Amazon rainforest, seaweed that you can eat. There seems to always be something coming up, especially if you are awake because of pain, late night TV, the infomercials, they're targeting you. I mean, it's, it's marketing. What's interesting, if you look at the trends over the last few decades, you see that more and more people are dealing with pain, and yet the rates of treatment go right along with it. Now that's a problem in the medical world because if you're getting to the cause of the problem, eventually your treatment causes a dip, and then the treatment requirements should dip. That's not what we're seeing with pain. More is not better. Increases in the rates of imaging, opioid prescriptions, injections, and fusion surgery might be justified if there were substantial improvements in patient outcomes. So what these authors are saying is that it would be fine if we're treating more people as long as patients were getting better. Unfortunately, they do not. In fact, statistics indicate that disability from musculoskeletal disorders is rising and not falling. The next myth. You'll have to learn to live with it. And I think this is one of the most sinister myths because it usually comes from the mouth of a healthcare professional. And I think what's sinister about it is that it also means, uh, you know, there's really not much hope anymore. Now, I don't have studies for this one, but I do have what we see in our clinic, and I can tell you that's not true because every day, every week, we see people who have been diagnosed with chronic pain syndromes, feel better than they have in years, degenerative conditions become mobile and stable. And I say this humbly, it's not because I'm that smart or that great, it's, it's not. When I was researching this, this book, I started to realize that there is a common theme that the best healers in the nation for physical medicine use. And it's, and it's a principle that's so simple that once I put it up there, you're going to say, oh yeah, everyone knows that. But it seems like it's so far off our radar that it is a secret. You are and you will be as pain-free when you are as healthy as possible. Like your hip will be as pain-free as possible when it's as healthy as possible. The back will be as pain-free as possible when it's as healthy as possible. I know what you're thinking, duh. But just because the statement is simple doesn't diminish its power. In fact, it's when your muscles and joints aren't healthy, that's when they break down, and that's when pain comes in. So if there is one thing you remember from our time, let it be this. You are as pain-free as you are healthy. Now, I want to lean into this with you because Health is a tricky word. It's like we all want to be healthy. No one wants to be sick. But what does health really mean? So before I can get you there, I have to ask you this. And I will require participation on this. How do you know if you're healthy? Feel good. Feel good. I've asked that question so many times, and that is the first response. Now, there's, there's truth in that, is that if you feel bad, okay, that's a bad sign. 
but there's also a problem with it. It usually means we don't think about our health until we feel bad. And see, some, some of the things that get us now are things that we can feel. You cannot feel your arteries clog. You cannot feel cancerous tumors grow. You cannot feel muscle imbalance. You cannot feel joints become dysfunctional. It's only once those things have gotten so bad that now they cause damage, a symptom appears. The clog actually occludes the artery. Now the heart doesn't get oxygen. The cells begin to die. That's damage. You get a heart attack. Cancerous tumors grow, but it's not until they disrupt the nearby organ function that we get a symptom. And muscles and joints become so out of bounds and so dysfunctional, but it's not until cartilage breaks down, nerves get irritated, that we actually pick up the symptom. So we, we can't wait for the symptom. We should listen to it, but we can't wait for it. So every day we got to wake up knowing that I'm doing the right things to preserve my health. And that's what I hope to show you is how do you actually preserve the health of your musculoskeletal system? So health. If you open up a medical dictionary, it usually reads something like this. Health is the state of optimal function. Optimal function. That's the key. When your muscles and joints function as good as possible, that's when they're going to be as pain-free as possible. But one thing that I see a lot of people get hung up on is what I call the structure myth, or the give up. You've got arthritis, give up. You've got degeneration. I put a joke in here that's really bad, but I, th I, thought, I think I should say it. <laughs> so to all of you that are wondering if there is a cure for arthritis, as a chiropractor, I think I've cracked it. Yeah. <laughs> that was really bad. That would make my dad proud. My dad's a pastor, and he's known for giving really bad jokes in his sermons, like the ones that, that it's like a duck that dies in the front row. <laughs> OK. Let's look at this. Sorry, this might be kind of hard to see, but I'll, I'll talk it out. So these researchers looked at thousands of MRIs, thousands of MRIs. And, and look at what they found here. Disc degeneration. 80% of 50-year-olds have disc degeneration. 88% of 60-year-olds, 93% of 70-year-olds, 96% of 80-year-olds have disc degeneration. Disc bulges. 60% of 50-year-olds, 70% of 6-year-olds, 77% of 70-year-olds, 84% of 80-year-olds. So a lot of people are dealing with a lot of arthritis, but there is something very unique with these populations. Has anyone caught it? Let's look at the title. Degenerative Spine Imaging Findings in Asymptomatic Patients. Asymptomatic. They are without pain. How can these thousands of people have such high amounts of degeneration, arthritis? I mean, even look at this. 37% of 20-year-olds. How can they have so much of this and yet not be in pain? Because the function of the joints is more important than the structure. The function is more important than structure. Health is not the state of optimal structure. It's the state of optimal function. Now, when <laughs> this is one of my favorite sayings, by the way. This is just, I just, it's like, what? Thanks for friends. How do we keep our musculoskeletal systems healthy? Exercise. Exercise. Invariably, that, that's the answer. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a myth. It's a myth. And in order to prove that to you, I need to take you back to the year 1954. Could be a dream. Life could be a dream. Do, 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 Okay, this was the year Elvis Presley started his career. Roger Bannister broke the four-minute mile, and the U.S. Supreme Court said it was unconstitutional for schools to segregate against race. It's a little break. It was during this time, physical fitness experts started to see that kids at that time weren't as well physically developed as previous generations. And I find that shocking because I, I mean, I see that now. If we look at today's adolescence compared to like when I was a kid, 
But at that time, they started to see that uh, the kids, they're not as developed, they're not as strong, they don't show as much coordination. So they did a test. You know, it's called the Krauss Weber test for minimum muscular fitness. And what they checked was basic movement patterns. Now, okay, this looks like a sit up, but really what they're checking with the leg straight is the ability or strength of your hip flexing muscles. Here's core strength. Here they're lifting the legs. This coordinates a neutral and organized spine with lower body control. It's what we call a hollow arch. They're extending the back, the ability of your postural muscles to pull you back. Lower leg strength and then overall flexibility. 1954, 58% of American children fail. 9% of European, European children fail. It's a big deal. These researchers, they actually get into the president. They give it to President Eisenhower, and it's called the report that shocked the president. Because it proved, according to the headline, that the US is rapidly becoming the softest nation on earth. And at that time, Eisenhower sees that it's a military threat. Like, we, how can we fight if we're not fit. So he enacts regulations that Kennedy later builds on that become our physical education system as we know it. Where has it gotten us? 15% of US population is physically disabled, 20% suffer chronic pain, 80% don't get enough movement, and 70% are overweight or obese. Now, don't get me wrong, it's, it's probably better than what it would have been if, nothing's, if nothing would have happened. Exercise by itself isn't enough to keep our muscles and joints functioning optimally. And this is why medically, when we talk about exercise, really what we mean is fitness. Fitness has two components, locomotion and manipulation. Locomotion is you moving from point A to point B. Manipulation is you using your body to move something else from point A to point B. When we go to the gym and we use machines, we go to bone builders, we go for a walk, we go to water aerobics, go to a class. Those things are not bad. You should do them. It's important for human health for you to exercise. But it's more about how far you move, how much you move, and how long you can move for. That's fitness. And it's not about how well you move. And to be clear, when you have a well-functioning musculoskeletal system, you move well. And it might seem like I'm splitting hairs, but I'm not. And this is why is that if you exercise joints that don't move well, you get injured. And we see this all the time in the practice. We see it in sports with kids. Kids are getting injured left and right. I'm reminded of a patient who, middle-aged, does all the good things, runs, eats right, yoga, biking, cross-country skis. One day she wakes up with the most severe case of sciatica pain I've ever seen. And when she shows up in my clinic, it's a year later, and she's been through the medical gamut, every imaging, she's, all types of stuff. I remember vividly sitting in the room, she's in tears, partly because of the pain, but partly because she keeps saying things like, I just don't understand how something like this can happen to me, I'm so fit. So back to the question, how do we get our muscles and joints to actually function better? Just imagine this, when you think of somebody, imagine someone in your life who moves well, how do they move? What do they look like? We can agree that they're probably two things. Number one is that they're mobile, which they have a full range of motion and they can go through that motion easily. And number two is that they're stable. They're coordinated and they're balanced. Mo mobile and stable. That is the definition of a healthy musculoskeletal system. That's how you move well. <coughs> now, the interesting thing is that, and I've, I've, I personally didn't know this until probably a few years back. I know most doctors don't know this. Most people don't know this. Our, the ability for us to be mobile and stable at the same time is because in our body, we actually have two, we have two different kinds of joints. Now, it's true that all of our joints move us, but they don't have the same responsibilities. And I, I'm just going to walk you through this. I think you'll see the pattern. Oh, there's the exercise mess. Moving well, they move often. OK, here's the pattern. Let's take your hip, for instance. The hip flexes forward, it flexes back. 
It extends to the side. You can bring it across your body. It rotates inward and outwards. Let me ask you this. Is your hip made to keep you mobile or is it made to keep you stable? Your hip is actually a mobility joint. It's made to move. Mm -hmm. Now consider your knee. It really has one movement. It bends back and forth. Does your knee give you mobility or stability? Stability. stability. Okay, now we're on to something. Think of your ankle. Ankle flexes back, it extends, it rotates in and out, it goes like it inverts and it everts. It is a mobility joint. Now think of your arch though. The arch, arch is considered a joint. It's, an, it's a joint system. Arches are supposed to keep you stable. There's a repeating pattern of how the joints are supposed to keep us mobile and stable. Now I'll take it from here. Hips keep us mobile, low back, is supposed to keep you stable. I sit, I, I sit with patients and they, and they have low back pain. I ask, what are you doing? They go, well, I stretch every morning. Okay, so, uh, okay to a certain degree, stretching the low back is okay, but the low back doesn't need to be stretched. It needs to be stable. And if you are increasing the range of motion of a low back, you're actually gonna increase its instability. Your mid back is made to be mobile your lower neck and your shoulder blade, your shoulder girdle, is supposed to be stable. And then your upper neck and your rotator cuff are mo mobility joints. Now this also gives us insight on how joints go bad though. And this allows us to nip things in the bud. Just, just think of this here. So consider the arch. The human foot is an incredible thing. It was designed to be barefoot on Mother Earth throughout its entire life. It's incredible. Walking on ground, on grass, on dirt, and on earth is incredibly therapeutic for the feet. It's the perfect consistency. It gives, but not too much. It's firm, but not too much. It makes all of your foot muscles work. Shoes protect our feet. They weaken the foot. The foot was not made to handle cement floors that's covered by carpet all day, hardwood floors. So what has happened to most people's arches? They're flat, they collapse. Why do they collapse? Because they're unstable. Consider the hip. Hips, whether it's repetitive strain, a fall or slip or something like that, the first thing a hip does is that it loses its mobility. It becomes a little bit more immobile. Like it can't quite turn in as it should, can't quite turn out as it should. When the hip joint doesn't move, the bone becomes brittle, brittle bones break. Now that, you know, most people know that you don't fall and break a hip. It's actually, for the most cases, the hip breaks and then you fall. That, br that brittleness to it. Now that pattern sets us up to bust this myth. And I think this is most, one, of the common, I think one of the most common myths, but also one of the, I think the most, it kind of just gets in the way of people being well. I call it the one bad joint myth. I've got a bad hip, I've got a bad neck, I've got a bad shoulder, I've got a bad back. The truth is that you don't have a bad joint, you've got a bad chain of joints. Just let me give you an example. So let's say something happens and your low back loses some of its stability. Repetitive bending can do it. Sitting for too long makes the low back lose its stability. Now, the mo now, when it loses its stability, your muscles tighten up and your cartilage breaks down. That will cause pain. In the same moment, as this is starting to lose stability, your mid-back and your hip compensate and they start to lose their mobility. So you can go in and you can get your low back treated and we can get rid of pain. We can do all types of things to get rid of the low back pain. But if the immobility that's set in in response to the low back's instability isn't cleared out, you're just a ticking time bomb waiting for another low back flare up. The immobility of these joints now are gonna force instability into the low back. It has to be cleared out. It's kinda like you have four tires in your car that are going bad and you're replacing one of them. Well, that one's better, but the other three are gonna make that, well, the problem is still there. I think this is so important, but also so overlooked that one thing that we do at our clinic is that I, I do a, what's, it's a 21 point pain track down assessment. 
what the goal is, is that we scan the entire chain of joints, find whatever the weakest link is, treat pain, but also start going after and strengthening the weakest link. But I also hope that you see the potential that this has, because let's say you actually do have a joint that is like completely shot. Like maybe it's a rotator cuff, maybe it's a hip, I don't know. But it, there really is not much more you can do for it, okay? But you can go up the chain. Let's say it is the rotator cuff. You can work on your shoulder blade's stability. The shoulder blade should stick to your rib cage. If it starts to wing out, that really stresses the rotator cuff even more. If your shoulder blade is stable, then you move to your mid-back. Your mid-back should be very mobile. You should be able to rotate and get that thing moving. It should be able to flex and bend. If the mid-back is locked up and the shoulder blade is, is unstable, the rotator cuff, the breaking down process just keeps going. So we can address, may not be able to address that joint, but you can address the chain of joints. When your joints, or your muscles and joints function well, they are mobile and stable. Being pain-free or as close to it as possible requires us to keep our muscles and joints as mobile and stable as possible. How do we keep our mobility joints mobile and our stability joints stable? Here's a few quick and dirty secrets. Number one, alignment is important. Joints get shifted up. So play along with me. Everyone go like this. Like get your fingers to fit between the two fists. Bring them all the way across. That's a dislocation. That is not good. Okay? Go like this one more time, and now just twist one hand. They're still touching. This is what we call a subluxation. Sub, meaning like subflooring, it's submarine, it's less than a dislocation. This happens to joints all the time. The most effective way to clear out a misaligned joint that's stuck not moving is through a chiropractic adjustment. The research is quite clear. If the goal is pain-free as possible, get a chiropractic alignment once or twice a month. Number two, follow the 24-hour rule. Here's the rule. Within 24 hours, if you don't take your joints through their full range of motion within 24 hours, you lose about a millimeter of that motion. So the 24-hour rule is have something, like kind of like brushing your teeth, but for your joints to take them through their full range of motion. You don't have to find that on your own. Part of what's available on that back table is a handout. And I've had my rehab specialist, Sandra, who's the best, she was the gal doing the, yes, the assessments. She's put together this, it's very simple and straightforward. But, and I'll give you a, a tip that I've seen in practice that most people don't do it. But the people that do, they do it in the morning and they link it with another habit. It's like they wake up, they get dressed, they brush their teeth, and then they do this movement and then they have breakfast. Link it to part of your morning ritual. That's what I encourage you to do. Number three, trigger points and knots in muscles. They happen, they build up. It's what happens to muscles when, you, when we use them. It's actually, when we use muscles, let me ask you guys this, why does plaque form on our teeth? Why does plaque, why does plaque show up on our teeth? Yeah, brushing gets rid of it, but we get plaque because we eat food. So as long as you're eating food, you're gonna get plaque, okay? As long as you're moving your muscles and your body, you're gonna get muscle knots and trigger points and scar tissue. Now, if you don't brush the plaque off your teeth, it leads to much bigger issues. Same thing with our, with our muscles. If you don't get in there or somebody get in there and break up the trigger points and knots, they are only gonna get tighter. The research I've seen, full body massage, therapeutic massage, once or twice a quarter. Get in there. Have it done. There's also home, like soft tissue or muscle work you can do. Like there's a foam roller, you can get a heart. Some people like to use tennis balls, those are cool. A lacrosse ball is a hard rubber ball. You can really put a lot of pressure into the lacrosse ball. That can work on the knots, but it's got to be on your radar. So get your trigger points and knots worked on once or twice a quarter. Stability though. Mobility. Is, is important, stability is just as important, but I also think it's one of the most misunderstood parts of how to keep our muscles and joints healthy. So first remember that stability is not about your strength or endurance. It's not about fitness. Your stability is about coordination and balance. You don't need strong muscles for that, you need smart muscles for that. Now, 
How many senses do we have? Five. five. Okay. What are they? Can we name the five senses? Sight, sound, sound, hearing. hearing. So, it's, so sight, hearing, smell, sound. taste, hearing, hearing. and touch. Five senses. I'm going to prove to you right now that everyone has a sixth sense. So I'm going to have you all close your eyes for a moment. Shut your eyes. And now, okay, everyone's eyes are closed. My eyes are closed. I'm going to have you hold out your arm and just put up your, your pointer finger. So you're, it's like you're holding up the number one with your hand. Keep your eyes closed. Open up your eyes. Look at that, 100% success. Now here's my question. How did you know you were doing that? You couldn't see it. You couldn't smell it. You didn't taste it. You didn't hear it. And you weren't touching it with your other hand. How do you know that your hand was out there? You just know. It's your sixth, it's your sixth sense. The, the medical term is proprioception, but it's our joint sense. It's the ability of our brain to know where our joints are. This is how it works. It's a specialized part of your nervous system. These nerves detect your joints. These nerves tell your brain what your joints are doing. Your brain interprets it in real time, sends signals into your muscles, telling your muscles how to keep the joints stable. Joints move, fires the nerves, brain interprets. That's the process. That's, that's how coordination and balance works. Now here's the thing. Now I should say it's the better and faster this system is, the more coordinated and balanced you are, the more stable you are. Now this relay system is established in our first 21 months of being born. This is the time when our brains figure out our body. And as your body develops, the brain gets more information and it follows an incredibly predictable pattern. Every human, every human, as far as we know, humans since, since the dawn of humans, go through this exact same pattern. Babies get control of neck. They start to, I might have a slide, here we go. Babies get control of neck, they begin rolling, they begin getting themselves into a plank position. Pretty soon they're up on one side, they're crawling. They get into a half kneeling position, they're standing, and then they're able to go on one leg. Everyone goes through this. This is how we are all wired for stability. The cool thing is that at the end of that, we come out with 10 distinctly different movement patterns. Every human does this. Kids have incredible mobility, and by two years, they have, they're able to do these. And, and this is what they are. I'll walk you through it. So the number one is the ability to tuck your chin all the way to chest. Number two is full neck extension. Number three is full rotation of your neck, getting all the way to collarbone, collarbone. Next one is actually we get control of our upper extremity. The first pattern is reaching arm behind, going to opposite shoulder blade. The next pattern is reaching above, going to the opposite shoulder blade again. From there, you might not be able to do this one, but I enjoy the participation. I wasn't <laughs> expecting this. The next one is mid-back mobility or rotation. So if you got room, at least get your arms up like this if you got room. Now here, you're trying to rotate your spine as far as you can and then go to your other side. Nice work, come back. <laughs> Next one is forward bending, or you go down, you touch your toes, able to push your weight backward under control and touch your toes. And by the way, when you, when you do this, you're supposed to have both knees and feet together. That challenges your stability. Next one is fully extending. Next one is what we call the single leg stance. You guys have probably seen this. This is a big move. It's just a, okay, being able to stand on one leg. And if you can do it with eyes open for 10 seconds, you should be able to do it with eyes closed for 10 seconds. The last movement, number 10, is a full squat. Being able to squat down fully to the ground, touch hands to the ground, and then come back up. I would try, but I would probably rip these pants. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Now, here's the thing with these movements, though, is that the vast majority of us lose these movements as we grow older. And the reason why is just our environment. We simply don't move as well as we used to. Now, I'm not saying they were super enlightened two or three or four generations ago, but the life that was lived back then required more movement and more diverse movement.
But as our modern day, we know we're the most sedentary humans ever. It's thought that our modern environment, while we're more connected electronically to everything and everyone else, our brain-body connection is getting lost. Now, when you came in, my rehab assistant, Sandra, who's amazing, <laughs> she took some of you through a, just two of these movements, full chin, full chin flexion, full rotation. So out of everyone she checked, 50% 50, 50 of you failed the first test. And out of the second one, 40% of you failed the second test. And those are the two most basic movements, flexion and rotation. What if we were to start challenging the hip mobility and being able to bend forward? How would that show up? If we can't move our joints well, and this is how it starts to feed on itself, it's a vicious cycle. If we can't move our joints well, these nerves send distorted signals. It's like incomplete messaging, bad reception with your cell phone to the brain. The brain doesn't get the information it needs to coordinate your muscles, keep you balanced, which means you lose your stability. Once you start losing your stability, your joints don't move properly, you lose your mobility which then makes the nerves fire even worse. The brain understands even less, and so it makes even more mistakes with your muscles. The joints become dysfunctional. The whole system starts breaking down. You add that for a couple decades, and now we have degeneration. We have bone spurring. We have arthritis. We have an epidemic of pain that we haven't seen before. Now, this is just my opinion, but we can have all the mops in the world, but the faucet to the musculoskeletal system is how well we move. And if we're not moving well, our faucet is leaking, and that, it's got to be cleaned up. So all of this brings us to the final myth on stability. It's the do it on my own myth. Because the truth is, I wish I could say, hey, do x, y, z every day, and your body's mobility and stability would start to rebuild itself. I can't because that's not the truth. Every body is different. Everyone has different stresses on their life. Each condition that's developed has to be addressed in a head-on way, but in a very specific manner. Every body has a different weakest link, and therefore every body needs to be trained on how to do these movements. But once you got these movements down, it's actually quite simple to keep them well. But here's what I can do today. I had mentioned during the mobility part that we've, we're giving you this home protocol. It's kind of like brushing your teeth for your spine. This same protocol helps instill your stability as well. It's general. It's, it might be a game changer for you. It probably won't be, but it should at least nudge you in the right direction for it. So I, just, I encourage you to do that. So. Lastly here, first I just want to thank you guys all for coming, taking time out of your Thursday to come listen to me jibber-jabber. Um, let's give the gals who put this on a round of applause. And, and I'll finish with this. Um, I don't know many of you, and I don't know what pains ail you, but despite that, I know that there is one thing true about you, because it's true about me and, and it's true about all of us, it's that I do believe that we were all meant to age gracefully. And the key to that, in my opinion, is making sure that we move well. And truly, the fact that we're born with this wiring is a miracle in, in and of itself. And so this is me. I believe God has put incredible wisdom in our bodies. Our job is to listen to it, but even more importantly, to trust what we're hearing. So the secret to being pain-free is to focus on being healthier. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is no myth. Thank you.